A History of Menstruation. Periods. About 50% of the population gets them. But this natural process of shedding the uterine lining every month as part of fertility has long been shrouded in mystery, embarrassment, and taboo. Let's take a look back in time and see how women in the past and in various cultures have dealt with and been treated during that time of the month. The word menstruation is derived from the Latin and Greek words for month and moon. That is because most women start a new period every 28 to 29 days, similar to the moon's 29.5 day orbit around the Earth. This led many ancient people to believe that women's menstrual cycles were linked to the phases of the moon. Because of this connection, mythology across the world personifies the moon as a goddess, often with powers over fertility. The Greek goddess Selene, the Roman Luna, Abuk of the Dinka in South Sudan, Mayumwai in Korean mythology, Lona in Hawaii, Metzteli among the Aztecs, Mamakila among the Inca. Ancient Mayans believed menstruation was punishment for the moon goddess sleeping with the sun god. Her blood was said to be stored in 13 jars and was transformed into snakes, insects, poison, and diseases. In ancient North and South America, men feared that unless women's periods were carefully monitored and synchronized, the universe might descend into chaos. Several recent studies have not found a link between modern women's menstruation and the cycles of the moon, or that women living in proximity to one another sync up when they menstruate. Women in the past often had lighter periods, and far fewer of them than we do today. Because pre-industrial societies had higher rates of illness and malnutrition, women had their first period later and menopause earlier. And without effective forms of birth control, women spent a much larger share of their reproductive years pregnant and breastfeeding. To learn more, check out my videos on the history of birth control and the history of pregnancy. So women of the past could expect on average 150 periods in their lifetime, while modern women in developed nations have about 450 periods, three times as many. Women throughout history have grabbed whatever was convenient and absorbent when dealing with their menstruation. The Ebers Papyrus, the oldest existing medical document dating back to the 15th century BCE, records that women in ancient Egypt fashioned tampons out of soft rolls of papyrus. Egyptians also used menstrual blood as a beauty product. They believed it could lift sagging breasts and skin. Ancient Greek physician Hippocrates described women making tampons out of lint or lamb's wool wrapped around lightweight absorbent wood. Sea sponge is also believed to have been used. Paper was first invented in China in 105 AD and was introduced in Japan in the 6th century. Women in ancient Japan rolled up paper to make tampons and used bandages to hold them in place. Hawaiian women used the furry part of the native hapu fern. Women in Indonesia employed vegetable fibers, and in equatorial Africa, they used rolls of grass. Native American women fashioned pads out of moss and buffalo skin. The Cherokee believed that menstrual blood was a source of great feminine strength and had the power to destroy their enemies. Roman philosopher Pliny the Elder wrote that if a menstruating woman stripped naked and walked around the field, insects would fall off crops and she could scare away hailstorms, whirlwinds, and lightning. Pliny also wrote that the touch of a menstruating woman could turn linen black, dull a razor, and sour wine. Mathematician, philosopher, and astronomer Hypatia of Alexandria was once being romantically pursued by a male student. She wasn't interested, and after multiple attempts to make that clear to him, she resorted to throwing her bloody menstrual rags at him and declaring, This is what you really love, my young man, but you do not love beauty for its own sake. He was so revolted that he abandoned his pursuit immediately, leaving Hypatia in peace. 
In many cultures throughout history, men have viewed menstruation with disgust and have extended that yucky feeling to women in general, using menstruation as a way to keep women unequal. In the Hebrew Torah, a menstruating woman is called Nida and is seen as ritually unclean. Anything that she touches is also contaminated, and if her husband touches her, he is unclean until sundown. Men and women are forbidden from having sex during menstruation and for a week after until the woman immerses herself in a ritual bath called a mikvah. Orthodox Jews still follow these rules, but most other denominations do not. Hindu husbands were similarly advised not to touch their wives during menstruation and that sex during this time might result in the birth of evil-minded, villainous offspring. Even today, in many traditional and rural homes, menstruating women must confine themselves to a single room. They must also miss school and work during this time. After three days, women take a ritual bath called a ritusnana, after which they should immediately have sex with their husbands in order to ensure conception. Third century Pope Dionysus of Alexandria wrote that pious women would not dare when in that state to approach the holy table. Therefore, women of the Coptic, Russian, and Greek Orthodox churches often refrain from taking communion or attending church while on their periods. But not everyone saw menstruation as the curse of womankind. Guru Nanak, the 15th century founder of Sikhism, condemned the practice of treating women as impure during menstruation. He taught that the menstrual cycle is God-given and required for the creation of human life. Buddhism takes a similarly enlightened view, though menstruating women may choose not to bow during prayers for comfort. In her best-selling historical novel, The Red Tent, Anita Diamant popularized the idea that women in biblical times gathered together while they menstruated and gave birth in a tent separate from the rest of the tribe. Together they bonded, consoled, and performed secret rituals. While this would have been a practical way to avoid contaminating everything in the village, there is no evidence that women of the biblical era gathered in menstrual tents. But Diamond didn't make the red tent out of whole cloth. Women throughout the world turned taboos in their favor by going on strike from sex and domestic chores and even retiring to menstrual tents, huts, and houses separate from men to commune with other women. When a native Yorok woman of California was on her moon time, she would refuse to cook for her husband or do household chores for 10 days. As she was at the height of her power, it was believed that she shouldn't waste her time on mundane tasks, distractions, or worries about the opposite sex. Rather, all her energies should be applied to meditation. She would move into a menstrual hut in the mountains with other women in the community, and together they would bathe and perform rituals in the sacred moontime pond. It was recorded that all women in the community menstruated at the same time, and that if a woman fell out of sync with her sisters, she could ask the moon to balance her. Women in the Kalasha Valley in northwestern Pakistan call their communal menstrual house, or Bashali, their most holy place. It is the largest building in the center of the village and is always filled with women gossiping, laughing, singing together, sharing advice, and giving birth. The women bring their babies and young children with them, but the Bashali is off-limits to men. Among the hunter-gatherers of the Ituri forest in eastern Congo, gender equality is strong. They celebrate a young woman's first period with joy and festivity. She is escorted into the Alima Hut, a large temple at the center of the community. Inside, older women give her practical lessons about boys and sex and teach her ancient songs. When the girls emerge, they go on the warpath to playfully hunt out boys with big whipping sticks. If a boy gets whipped, he must try to get past the older women and enter the Alima Hut. During their first menstruation, young Aborigine women in Australia live in menstrual huts built by their mothers. When their period is over, they bathe in the river and the hut is burned down. 
Over the years, many patriarchies co-opted menstrual separation as yet another way to oppress women. To this day, Jewish women in the Ethiopian highlands must stay in Nida huts for seven days. They are not allowed to cook anything but coffee and roasted grains. These women report mixed feelings on the practice. Some describe fear, cold, and lack of food, while others enjoy the social interaction and relaxation. Hindu women in western Nepal must reside in small, windowless huts called chiopati for five days during their period. Girls who are menstruating for the first time must stay in the hut for at least 14 days. This practice forces young women to miss many days of school. And every year, dozens of women and girls die in menstrual huts because of snake bites, assault, freezing temperatures, and suffocation because of lack of ventilation. In 2005, Nepal's Supreme Court outlawed the use of menstrual huts, but the ban is not widely enforced. In medieval Europe, blood was seen as a carrier of toxins, hence the dubious medical practice of bloodletting. Menstrual blood was considered highly contaminated, and it was believed that drinking it would cause leprosy. Midwives offered herbal pain relief to women with especially painful periods, but any such remedies were kept very secret and never written down, as the medieval church preached that, as with the agony of childbirth, menstrual cramps and discomfort were women's punishment for Eve's original sin. Wearing pants was seen as exclusively masculine and improper for women, so under their many layers of skirts, most women's undercarriage was open to the breeze. To learn more, check out my History of Underwear video. Additionally, reaching under all those petticoats to change a feminine hygiene apparatus would have been quite an undertaking. When that time of the month arrived, women had to get creative about how they dealt with it. Some bled freely into their chemise or shift, a linen slip worn next to the skin, which was the only item of clothing washed regularly. Others came up with belt or diaper-like garments using old rags. Cloth was labor-intensive to produce and valuable, so after use, the rags had to be soaked, washed by hand, and reused. In the late 1700s, male doctors took over gynecology, pushing the tried-and-true midwives out and painting them as ignorant and unsanitary. Now charged with caring for women's health, these doctors didn't care to learn much about it. The medical establishment failed to ask women about their own experiences and did a lot of assuming and guesswork from the outside. In the early 1800s, pantalettes and bloomers came into fashion. These billowing undergarments were crotchless, so women could relieve themselves without removing their layers of skirts and corsets. Women pinned strips of cotton and flannel into the gap to absorb their menstruation. With the invention of and craze for rubber in the 1850s, sanitary aprons or strips of rubber worn between the legs were used. While they saved clothes from staining, they trapped in bacteria, worsened odor, and led to rashes and infections. In the late 1800s, the Hoosier sanitary belt was invented. This waistband allowed washable pads to be clipped in and run through the legs. Though they were an improvement on loose rags and diapers, they were still chunky and uncomfortable. But as manufacturers didn't bother to come up with anything better, they remained in common use until the 1970s. By the late 1800s, more women were entering the workforce, attending university, and pushing for the right to vote. Men opposed to female progress attempted to use menstruation as a scientific argument against equal participation. Dr. James McGregor Allen proclaimed that, in intellectual labor, man does now and always will surpass women for the obvious reason that nature does not periodically interrupt his thought and application. Health reformer and cornflake enthusiast John Harvey Kellogg instructed that women should rest completely during menstruation. 
Harvard medical professor Edward H. Clark wrote that the rigors of a college education would be too taxing on the female mind and body. He hypothesized that when women were menstruating, gravity would pull too much blood from their brains, and therefore they should remain home lying in bed rather than standing in lecture halls. He warned upper-class families away from sending their daughters to university, lest they become infertile. It is interesting to note that no one was suggesting that working-class women should spend their periods lounging in bed. Rather than pushing misogynistic pseudoscience, Dr. Mary Putnam Jacoby conducted a scientific study on the matter. She collected extensive physiological data, including muscle strength tests, on women throughout their menstrual cycles. She published her findings in a groundbreaking 1876 research paper, in which she concluded that there is nothing in the nature of menstruation to imply the necessity or even desirability of rest. Adding, women were healthy when they were educated, mentally engaged, and physically active. Not only did Jacoby scientifically disprove Clark's claims, she was awarded the Boylston Medical Prize from Clark's University, Harvard. Unfortunately, this hard science did not put an end to the taboos surrounding menstruation. During World War I, nurses discovered that cellucotton, a type of cheap bandage made out of wood pulp, worked miraculously well for absorbing their periods. The private sector bought up the warehouses full of bandages left over after the war and repackaged them. Kotex disposable pads were introduced in 1920, but they didn't catch on right away. Women were embarrassed about going into a drugstore and asking for something for their periods. Stores set up tables with Kotex wrapped in plain brown packaging so women could leave a nickel in the jar and walk out discreetly with their necessities, further reinforcing the idea that they should be ashamed about their periods. Kotex finally caught on when they started appearing for sale by order in the 1926 Montgomery Ward catalog. In the 1920s and 30s, fashion changed dramatically from massive skirts that could easily conceal a bulky menstrual pad and belt to slim-fitting short skirts that could not. The first minstrel cup, called the Tacit, was invented by actress Leona Chalmers. Around the same time, the tampon hit the market, but both products failed to gain popularity as it was widely believed that their use would tarnish a woman's sexual purity. As female virginity was still highly prized, these products were marketed exclusively to married women. Young women were stuck with bulky belts and had to plan looser-fitting clothes and avoid swimming during that time of the month, lest anyone know that they were on the rag. In 1957, the pill was approved to regulate menstrual cycles and help women deal with severe menstrual disorders, not as a contraceptive. An unusually large number of women began reporting severe menstrual disorders. In 1969, Stay Free introduced the first adhesive pad called the Maxi Pad, and it was an instant hit. Women were thrilled to finally throw out those awful, hundred year old Hoosier belts and enjoy more freedom of dress and movement. Once new women's hygiene products became a profitable business, advertisers changed their tone and they began trying to convince women that using tampons had nothing to do with so-called virginity. The word period was uttered for the first time on American TV by Courtney Cox in this 1985 Tampax commercial. Today, women are looking for new ways to make their period even more comfortable and less inconvenient. Birth control pills and IUDs are marketed as a way for women to have lighter and fewer periods. Minstrel cups are making a comeback, and absorbent, reusable underwear has also come into fashion. Both have cost-saving benefits and are much more environmentally friendly than disposable pads and tampons. 
advocates have brought attention to the inequality of the tax many countries add to the purchase of feminine hygiene products when other basic necessities are exempt. Pads and tampons are expensive, and many women and girls around the world struggle to afford them, often missing school and work if they cannot. The stigma that menstruation is embarrassing and should be kept secret prevails in both developing and developed countries. This prevents women from talking about their periods and better understanding what they are going through and what level of pain and other symptoms are normal. It takes an average of eight years for a woman suffering from endometriosis to get a diagnosis because both she and her doctor may not know that her symptoms are outside of the norm. Additionally, the lack of male understanding about menstruation perpetuates many myths and often allows men to dismiss women's feelings because she's on her period. Slowly, women are becoming more comfortable talking about and owning their menstruation, breaking the taboos around it. As women open up a dialogue and have more opportunities to get involved ourselves, science, medicine, and industry are developing new and better ways for us to deal with that time of the month. After all, it only took us a few thousand years to get something better than a rag. I will be donating ad revenue from this video to Days for Girls. This organization provides comfortable, reusable pads, menstrual cups, and other hygiene products to young women around the world. Days for Girls also provides education about periods and health to help lift the stigma of menstruation and keep women and girls safer and healthier. To learn more about Days for Girls, click on the link in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, comment your thoughts, and check out my other Royal History videos. If you really want to help, please consider supporting me on Patreon. A link is in the description. Thank you for watching.